My name is um, Gabriela Mejias, and I work at DataSite as the community and program manager. And today I'll give you an introduction of DataSite's infrastructure. Um, to begin speaking about the infrastructure we provide, we need to speak about persistent identifiers. And a persistent identifier is a unique alphanumeric string uh, referring to a digital uh, resource. And um, this string always points to the same uh, resource, which is a metadata representation, a landing page with metadata information. Um, this can be updated um, through, throughout the time. Uh, so this is what guarantees the persistence um, of that um, record. And um, persistent identifiers are important because they help identify um, entities across a research ecosystem, such as uh, people, places, and things. For individuals, um, for example, researchers, we have persistent identifiers like ORCID IDs and ISNI identifiers. For places, such as research organizations, um, we have uh, ROAR identifiers. Uh, ROAR is the research organization registry. And for things such as research outputs and resources, uh, we have identifiers such as DOIs, handles, IGSN, uh, ARCs, and more. And persistent identifiers are important because they'll, they help make the research fair. Um, if you uh, haven't heard of the FAIR principles, uh, these are some principles to uh, make research uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And persistent identifiers and the associated metadata are important because they help um, increase the discoverability and visibility and also citation and reuse. Uh, of research outputs and resources. And with all these, they help increase the recognition of um, uh, research. So now let's move uh, forward to uh, speaking about data sites. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization established in 2009 by and for the research community. Uh, we work with the research institutions across 50 countries. And um, together, we're a community of organizations uh, that aims to um, identify um, um, research and uh, knowledge. And we provide uh, many different uh, services. Um, and um, our community, um, as I said before, um, is based uh, across uh, 50 countries. Currently, we have 280 uh, plus members. Uh, from this, uh, we have more than 50 consortia. Consortia are groups of organizations that come together to take a more uh, wider uh, approach to uh, adoption of our infrastructure. So overall, uh, more than 1,200 organizations um, have connected their repositories into our registry. Um, and so far or to date, we have more than 41 million DOIs registered by our community. And um, these are um, the, the services uh, we provide and enable. So as I mentioned before, um, DOI and metadata registration uh, that help improve um, the discoverability and the reuse of the research production. Uh, we also provide um, means to track the influence of research like dashboards and analytics and APIs. And um, also uh, we promote uh, best practices um, to uh, identify and share information about research. And um, we have a metadata schema. The data site metadata schema's current version is 4.4. So you can see um, that the schema contains uh, mandatory, recommended, and optional attributes. Uh, so for mandatory are the identifier itself, um, the creators uh, of that item or output, the title of the item, the publisher, uh, like the repository uh, that uh, hosts that information, the publication year, and the resource type. 
So um, data sets are uh, the most uh, widely used um, item or resource type in our registry, but we support a wide range of um, outputs and resources, and you can uh, see the list here. So beyond data sets, preprints, software, uh, dissertations, uh, images, and more. And uh, also important to mention that as of last year, uh, we've added uh, support for indigenous knowledge uh, rights uh, in collaboration uh, with an, orga an organization called Local uh, Context that have been working a lot um, on the promotion of the care principles for indigenous data governance. So it's possible to add on the rights field of the metadata uh, notices and uh, labels from uh, local context, and you can find more information on the link. And um, with all the infrastructure we provide, what we enable is research to be connected. And um, we've developed a technology called the PIT graph. The PIT graph is a network uh, of nodes um, that are entities um, that are identified by persistent identifiers and connected through relations in the metadata. Uh, so here you can see a snapshot of the PIT graph and you can see data sets uh, connected to publications, software, individuals, organizations, and funders. And uh, to make this technology more accessible, we've also developed a user interface called Datasite Commons. So this is a search engine where um, everyone can search by works um, and this uh, pulls uh, Datasite and Crossref uh, DOIs by individuals. Uh, so you can uh, search and pull this information by ORCID ID by organizations, and this is connected to raw identifiers and also by repositories. And this is um, the search engine is connected to re 3 data, which is the registry of research data repositories. And this is an example of how this uh, works. So it's possible to um, search for uh, a work uh, and enter a keyword. And in this case, the search retrieves a data set and um, you can see the title and uh, the DOI, uh, the publication date and more information. And um, it's possible among the other information to see if that item, uh, in this case, the data set has been cited. So here you can see this item has one citation and you can see it's a journal article and um, the identifier um, of that article. And as I said before, uh, this infrastructure uh, enables uh, recognition uh, for um, the creators or the researchers. So in this case, um, this is a data set and you can see the full list of uh, creators who contributed to that item and the, the, their affiliations, so their organizations. And uh, this also enables um, recognition for the institutions. So um, you can see um, in this case, um, uh, the record of an African organization, which is the World Agroforestry uh, Center. And uh, you can see um, their, um, overall um, production. So this is identified with a raw identifier and you can see all the works uh, they have connected in our registry, the citations, views and downloads, and also other identifiers and uh, some um, visualizations. And um, this is just uh, an overview of the infrastructure we provide. I'm going to now hand over to my colleague, Bosun Obileye, who is a data sites regional engagement specialist for Africa. Over to you, Osun. Thank you, Gabby. I hope you can all see my screen. It says loading. Um, maybe you can exit the, the full screen. Um, 
try again. Okay. Just a moment, please. Yes, now we can see. Thank you. Some boss will be just as given by Gabby. I'll be talking about global access program in Africa. First, data site launched this global access program, which we call GAP, with the support of Chan Zuckerberg Initiative to promote greater equity in the global research ecosystem. How do we achieve this? It's by expanding access to research outputs and resources in underrepresented regions. And we are talking about developing economies. Africa is one of the regions. The program aims to support the participation of researchers and organizations in the global scholar community and enable greater collaboration and innovations across borders. The Global Access Program has three major components. Number one is the funding. The second one is technical infrastructure. And then we have the outreach. For the funding, the program will provide the opportunity for communities to seek funding to support activities. Those are outreaches and infrastructure development related to the program. The call for this will be out by September. What I mean by the call is that we're going to send out a call which you can apply for and if you're successful you'll get you'll be part of those that will receive the funding your institution i meant technical infrastructure through partnership with local and international stakeholders the program will seek to support communities in building technical infrastructure per their needs so we know that you need to have repositories to host your PIDs, the pids and if that is the case will support you with technical support. Then, then the outreach, which is what we have in now in learning from local communities, stakeholders will seek to increase awareness of paid infrastructure. Global access in Africa. In Africa, um, the aim is to increase access to and adoption of paid services and infrastructure for African communities. And if you can see what we have here, we have regions within Africa. We have the Northern, we have the Western, we have the Central, we have the Eastern and the Southern. The aim is that we are going to reach across to all the regions within Africa. And just a little insight into what we have currently in Africa. As at April, 2023, we have 2,112 recognized institutions which exist in Africa. And in the Northern Africa, we have 758, which is the highest number, followed by the Eastern Africa, 614. Then we have Western Africa, which is 540. The Central Africa is 110, and Southern Africa is 114. It is good to know that Nigeria has the highest number of institutions as at April, but as at now, it is now 315. Awareness and infrastructure are both low in Africa, but in South Africa, it is high. Mbutunet is the only consortium lead of DOI for data site in Africa. And the institutional repository is at still at that early stage in Africa, meaning that the infrastructure is still evolving. There are many researchers only share the data when it is mandated by funders. So we won't see the donor or the funder is not talking about sharing the data, then that is no longer part of what will be done at the end of the research or during the research. Funding knowledge gap, scale gap, and value proposition constitute some constraints to paid adoption in Africa. So what our strategy? We want to organize, we want to engage and collaborate, then we're going to sustain. In organizing, we identify the infrastructural and awareness gap, and identify and connect with research and research stakeholders organizations. We are organizing quarterly webinar to create awareness and stimulate adoption in Q2, Q3, and Q4. And then we already heard about the Global Access Fund, which we want to use to support the continent. 
And then when we are engaging and collaborating, we are considering collaborating with research organizations, the research stakeholders and government institutions in the region. Also, we will be collaborating with decision and policy makers. We will be participating in relevant events in the continent also. And when we are sustaining, we are looking at supporting the existing consortium lead through direct engagements, webinars, and continuous collaboration. We want to partner with local and regional organizations to increase awareness of research and PID infrastructure. We want to continue to train, to engage, and to collaborate with the communities in Africa. And lastly, we want to promote community interaction. I know we can do this. Let's continue to work together. Thank you. So. Thank you so much, uh, Bosun, for the presentation. And now we're going to hand over to Harold uh, Boa uh, from the Ubuntu Net Alliance. Thank you very much, Gabby and Bosun. Um, my name is Harold Boa, as Gabby has said. I am the Business Development Officer at Ubuntu Net Alliance. Um, I'm glad to be here discussing the data set consortium, which Ubuntu Alliance leads uh, for Eastern and Southern Africa. So without further ado, let me share my screen and kick off the discussion. Um, can you confirm if you can see my screen? Yes, we can see. Thank you very much. Um, so as I said, uh, we are the uh, lead organization for the data site consortium for Eastern and Southern Africa. And naturally we're excited to hear about the global access program that is being launched by um, a data site as we will be benefiting directly. So this presentation is going to focus on the data site consortium that we have led since 2021, June, 2021. Um, we're going to look at the strategies that we have deployed, uh, the challenges that we have faced, um uh but then and then obviously it will be opened up for questions and answers but before that let's learn a little bit more about uh ubuntu alliance just a quick introduction about what we do so ubuntu alliance is the regional research and education network for eastern and southern africa um, what that means is we are the member organization for national research and education networks within the same region of eastern and southern africa um out of the 26 countries, we have managed to establish and uh, enroll 15 member entrants into our membership. Mm. And uh, amongst those 15, 14 of them are connected to our network, which we will see in uh, the next slide. We are able to benefit 1,000 plus institutions throughout that region and through our NRNs as well. And those institutions benefit 3 million plus students and staff. Our main priority is to support research and education throughout uh, Eastern and Southern Africa. And we do this primarily through our network, which you can see on your screen now on the right-hand side of the slide. Um, this network has got 20 points of presence across it, uh, across the backbone, connecting the 14 countries, uh, 14 entrants rather, which I had explained before. Um, Addis Ababa, that's the Ethiopia, and um, Botswana will be connected in the upgrade that we are conducting and completing this year. Our network appears in Europe in two places, in London and in Amsterdam. This allows us to connect our community to uh, the research and education community in Europe and also to other uh, regional rents such as um, Internet2 in the USA. Canaries in Canada, Wakren in Western Central Africa, and Asrin, which is not on the slide, in Northern Africa. So with this, we're able to ensure that there is a collaboration between our member entrants, their institutions, and the rest of the research and education community globally. Um, the network uh, upgrade will see the introduction of four new points of presence. Uh, that's um, one in Djibouti, the other one in Botswana, and um, another one in Johannesburg, and another one in uh, Lusaka. And uh, we have got five links in total on the network, and uh, every link has got uh, carries a capacity of 10 GB uh, per second. Uh, so beyond internet connectivity, we also 
support research and education in other ways. For example, uh, we have Eduroom, which is a global Wi-Fi consortium. Uh, I'm sure you have heard of it in some of uh, your engagements. Uh, we have got eduid.africa, which is an identity federation that was uh, launched by Wakren, Asren, and Ubuntu Alliance in collaboration. Through this identity federation, we're able to provide other services or <clears throat> we're able to open up the door for our NRNs and our institutions to have access to services that are able to, um, that require rather uh, identity federations. We've got a multi-cloud solution that is being developed. It's going to include um, our own cloud, uh, Ubuntu Alliance Open Source Cloud. We're currently working on a, working on a framework agreement with Amazon Web Services uh, to be included. And then we're going to leverage on that to see, to pursue other framework agreements with other cloud providers such as Microsoft in the future. We also provide content services um, through our platform called Utafiti Africa. Uh, this platform focuses on making researchers and helping researchers and research groups in Africa access grant research grant opportunities. And um, it also has other related services to uh, accessing research grants, such as um, video on demand courses and um, um, library resources. Yes, that help researchers to understand the best ways in which they can access grant uh, funding. Not only that, but then we also provide SSL certificates to our community. And finally, we also provide digital object identifiers. And with that, we can then open up the discussion for our data site consortium, which, as I earlier stated, we launched in June of 2021. On the right hand side of the of the slide, you'll be able to see the structure which the consortium follows. Uh, on the lead, we have Ubuntu and Alliance. Uh, we've got our member institutions uh, on the lower level, and then they connect their repositories. Um, I think if you have any questions on how the structure works, we can go into further details um, in the question and answer section. But um, as of now, we can focus on the influencing factors of why we, we decided to launch a data site consortium. Well, the first reason is because we understand the global initiative for open science and as the regional research and education network for Eastern Southern Africa, we want to ensure that our community also uh, leverages on this uh, global trend of open science and persistent identifier adoption is one of the key things in, in achieving um, openness. So we thought the digital object identifiers was a great place to start and therefore it led us to our um, decision to partner with data sites. Um, we also recognize the low uptake of persistent identifiers in Africa, which represents a digital divide between Africa and the rest of the world. You will appreciate the numbers uh, in, in, the, in further discussion during the webinar of how just how different the PID adoption is um, in Africa and as compared to the rest of the world. Um, thirdly, downstream consumption of research output. We want to increase access for African uh, research and out, I mean, research output to the rest of the world. It shouldn't just be Africa consuming, but rather Africa should be producing and the rest of the world should have access to that. With adoption of digital object identifiers, this can be achieved as the, the research output will then be more fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And finally, as a collaboration initiative, um, as researchers are able to use research output by their fellow researchers, not only within Africa, but also outside of Africa. It fosters collaboration within the research and education community. So what strategies have we put in place in order to um, increase the adoption of digital object identifiers within the data site consortium for Ubuntu and Alliance? The first one is the adoption of data site members in Eastern and Southern Africa. So data site already had some um, repositories registered to them and uh, I mean directly, but then with the coming in of the Ubuntu Alliance Consortium, we had an agreement that, uh, those, that those repositories that are within our region will be shifted to our consortium. Secondly, redirection of inquiries by data site. We do recognize that data site is more, has, is more established as a digital object identifier and therefore they will naturally get more leads regarding inquiries for how to set up digital object identifiers for repositories. So in as part of the agreement, they, when they get an inquiry, they redirect it to Ubuntu Netherlands, and then we proceed from there. And finally, community awareness and stakeholder engagement by Ubuntu Netherlands to try and um, acquire more 
um, members into our consortium. With these strategies, we currently have two repository members, that's Ethernet, that has got the digital library, Nadre, called Nadre and Somali Rain, which, uh, and both of these are our NREN our members. Somali Rain is Somalian NREN and um, Ethernet is our Ethiopian NREN member. Uh, we currently have 21,640 digital object identifiers registered, which is a, a small number in the global context. Uh, there is definitely room for growth, but then slow progress is still progress. So we still recognize this as uh, steps forward. Finally, let's look at the challenges that has that have hindered us from acquiring as many members, or I mean, as many members and also registering as many DOIs as possible so far. First of all, the NREN maturity um, to offer services at national level. Some of our NREN members are not mature enough already to um, offer this service at a national level, and, and therefore it has slowed down the, the adoption of digital object identifiers Maturity depends on what kind of NREN we're discussing uh, because they are all at different maturity levels. However, in, in many of our NRENs, there is a capacity problem, a human capacity problem rather, such that some NRENs exist as only a one-man NREN, whereby the only, there's only one um, person there, full-time there, less than five people in some NRNs. So um, problems like this affect adoption of uh, this service. Secondly, financial challenges for the NRN. Some of them are not able to uh, shoulder the cost of paying. Th that's not to say that the, the price is too high, but then rather the development of the NRN itself uh, requires them to focus their finances on their network and also other more pressing um, issues that they deem more pressing. Thirdly, understanding of the pricing system. Initially, we had a difficulty um, in communicating just how big the discount potential is for the adoption of digital object identifiers within the region. Therefore, this provided a hindrance. The payment system, I mean, the, the, the pricing system itself is fine and actually offers very good discounts. Uh, however, the communication of it sometimes is um, was rather a little bit difficult. But then since then, we have been able to solve this and we hope to gain more members as we go. Fourth, awareness and willingness to adopt and adhere to the FAIR principles, where FAIR for um, those that are not aware stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, which is the cornerstone for open science uh, data. We have noticed that within the region, even though awareness is increasing, but then the, will the willingness to adopt and adhere to the FAIR principles, which will then lead um, repository holders to uh, adopt uh, persistent identifiers such as digital object identifiers is not as strong as um, in other in other in the rest of the world. So this is a significant hindrance because if they don't if they're not willing to adopt and to adhere to the fair principles, then they will see um, it will be difficult to bring them on board. And finally, digital repository development in management, uh, digital, digital de repository development and management rather, not in management. My apologies for that. In the region. Um, those institutions that have got digital repositories um, sometimes are not uh, as keen on managing them or on continuously um, upgrading and, uh, and adopting uh, such that uh, the adoption of digital object identifiers has, um, has been low in, in those digital repositories. And in other institutions, um, the capacity itself to develop the digital repositories is difficult. I think this is something that was really resounded in the recent Open Repositories Conference that was held last week in South Africa that discussed in extension the digital repository situation in African institutions. Um, due to time, allow me to stop there, but then if there's anything, I'm sure we can pick it up in the question answers section. So with that, allow me to pass it back to Gabby, who is chairing the meeting. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Harold, for your presentation. And now we will hear from Olayemi Olowosawa from um, ITA, which is the uh, International Institute of Tropical Agriculture. Um, Yemi, over to you. Thank you, Gabby. I'll just share my screen now.
Let me just do this. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your second slide. Uh, if you switch okay. to the first one. Okay. Good morning, everyone, once again. My name is Olayemi. I am the Open Access Open Data Administrator for the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture headquarters in Ibadan, Nigeria, West Africa. I'll be speaking on uh, the data science gap in Africa and using specifically IETA as a case study. IETA started using data science in 2017. And um, what we principally use data site for is to generate uh, DOIs for uh, research data, for research projects, reports, articles, publications, samples from uh, experiments and field data, images and videos, uh, research databases, project support documentations, reports, all manner of research outputs that we want to store or archive are usually um, given a DOI. And uh, DOI generation is automated uh, with, with the use of Fabrica, data site Fabrica. And we also use data site API for integration services to integrate uh, research databases that are not principally uh, in the institutional data bank. The institutional data bank we use is SICAN, and we have research databases, for example, from cassava base, yam base. All this we have integrated into the institutional data bank using the um, data science API for such services. This is a screenshot of our data bank. And here we see the opportunity data site provides to cite data using 10 different citation methods. And this is an additional uh, benefit for our researchers. They are no longer restricted to using one citation method. They have the opportunity to select whatever citation method they have. One of the concerns we have is um, data citation. In most cases, Paper citations is very common, but data citation is not so common. So with the use of this, this data citation has become more uh, common and acceptable to scientists and even to publishers of um, journals who require data to be cited and data to be attached to the publications. We link uh, data now to publications. And there are online tools which can be used to generate these citations and data site is one of the tools we use. Citation has improved uh, visibility of IIT research and uh, researchers as well. And credit is given to where it is due because of the citation methods. Um, Gabby mentioned fairness. And this is one of the things we have de derived as benefits and values from data site DOI. Uh, data site uh, enables our data to be reused. It enables our data to be fair, to be visible. A proper attribution is given and it promotes partnership with projects. And um, like Harold mentioned, it improves collaboration and enhances, um, it also promotes uh, transparency with our funders and donors who uh, fund these projects. So we've been able to overcome many of the challenges, such as um, uh, that Harold probably listed. We, as a, in IIT, we've been able to overcome many of these challenges. Adoption has increased. Uh, funding has also increased slightly. IITA is funded by many organizations. So this particular issue of funding uh, problem may not be applicable to all the other institutions in West Africa and Nigeria, in particular where IITA is, who may be restricted by funding uh, and um, 
and other um, constraints. But for IIT, the issue of funding is not a challenge to us. Data science also helps to promote um, the institutional visibility, uh, repository researcher, and make sure that our data is inclusive. Uh, data is, um, we can find our data in the Guardian, which is a data search engine. Our repository is, is enlisted in the R3 data. We have our data linked to other global platforms, and it also increases our trust for repository and data in various um, repositories. Some of the values we have derived from data sites include, uh, like Gabby mentioned earlier, we can uh, see the research data metrics and the impact our data are having. We can measure the data download. We can provide data citation metrics. We can view the locations where data are being used or reused or accessed. And we can see which data are gaining attention and those that are with less impact. Data site also helps to provide insight on research data reusability and data completeness through uh, data measurement. On the other hand, data site uh, provides, uh, has been helpful in uh, putting a human face, like if I may use those words, it helps in uh, uh, providing job opportunities. When Harold was speaking, he did mention the challenges of adoption and things like that. Data with the uh, opportunity provided for a data advocacy office to speak with research institutions and researchers to advocate for buying in and inclusion in using data sites, uh, in using DOIs and, make, and creating funds for its sustainability. It provides opportunity for uh, a data repository officer to manage the data repositories and to maintain the databases in them. And of course, we have um, events like this, the webinars that helps in capacity development and building each uh, institution and members of those institutions who are interested, and also to provide networks where we can link up and collaborate with ourselves. And data sites, uh, DOI, we use it in standardization of research data and open science management. We encourage the use of standard metadata templates. We saw the template as shared um, in Gabby's um, slides. This is a metadata templates IIT follows. The scheme, the schema version 4.4 is what we use. And we've been able to integrate our research databases for a central DOI creation with data sites. And um, we also been able to develop a DMP template, which is used throughout the research um, data life, a, li a living document that is used for the data or research life cycle. So these are some of the values we've derived from data site. And as an institution, we enjoyed working with data site and uh, research um, data bank right now. We have over 3000 data sets in currently in a data bank. And each of these data sets has a DOI attached to them. So this is the IIT story. And these are the gaps we've been able to fill. Uh, data, data sets are visible. They are they are open, they are fair, they are accessible to all who is interested in um, getting in information from us. Thank you very much. If there are questions, I'll be happy to respond to them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Olayemi, uh, for your presentation. And um, with that, I think we can uh, start the Q&A session and um, let me um, yeah go to the Q&A section. So some uh, very important, uh, some- uh, Gabi, Gabi um, maybe we do the polling first. Oh, um, sorry. Yes, let's go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, so my name is Paul Fiekan. I'm data set outreach manager and technically facilitating this webinar and I'm just launching a poll to which I invite you to uh, with just two questions. And we really would like to have your feedback on this and uh, uh, highly recommend to participate. The first question is, does your organization have an institutional repository um, which to which you can reply either yes, no, 
or don't know if you don't know it. And the question, uh, second question uh, is, do you wish us to contact you after the event on how Dataset could support the visibility of your organization's research outputs? Please um, submit your choices and um, yes, uh, I, I can share the polls uh, while uh, during the Q&A session. So back to you, Gabby. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you so much, Paul. And yes, um, so during the Q&A, uh, some people ask a very important question, and, and that is, uh, what does DOI stand for, which I didn't mention, um, but DOI stands for Digital, Digital Object Identifier, it's a persistent identifier for um, objects, and yeah, I've mentioned on my presentation that um, we support a, a wide range of resource types uh, to, to identify. So uh, our DOIs help identify data sets, but also other kind of outputs like samples, preprints, software models, um, DMPs, and more. So thanks a lot for um, that question. Um, also, um, someone had a question. Uh, hi, Wesley. Uh, Wesley had a question for... Um, Harold uh, from the Ubuntu Net Alliance. Um, the Ubuntu Net Alliance is a regional um, research and education network and the consortium lead. And in this context, uh, what will be the role of local uh, NRENs uh, in the consortium? And um, Harold, I don't know if you'd like to um, elaborate more on the answer to that. Yeah, sure thing. Um... I answered it, of course, in the question, but then I, I thought it would be good to answer it live as well for everybody. But I was saying that we do recognize that the NREN um, can play a significant role. However, we decided to uh, go ahead with a consortium as an incubation for NRNs because we recognize that institutions within a, within a country could be willing to could be willing and able to adopt DJ object identifiers. However, the NREN is not ready to deploy it to them. So we incubate the NREN, uh, for lack of a better word, such that when we get enough institutions within their country, then we do the same thing that, for example, Datasite did with us, and then we give the organizations to the NREN um, when it's ready. So I, I think that's the answer to that. Thank you so much. And also, um, yeah, someone on the chat uh, said um, that uh, they have many questions and that they will engage uh, with you later, Harold. So uh, happy to, to connect you. Um, also, uh, one question, uh, how does one get a DOI? Um, so uh, ver another very important question. Question. So data site um, as a DOI um, provider organization, we work with institutions that adopt our tools uh, like our APIs or Fabrica, which is a user interface that uh, Yemi um, mentioned on, on her presentation. And that allows organizations to enable DOI registration through their repositories or platforms for um, researchers, some very uh, wide known um, repository platforms that use uh, our services are Zenodo or Archive, uh, to give you an example, but also um, we work with other organizations that want to integrate DOI registration in their institutional repositories or systems as um, Ola Yemi um, mentioned. Um, Olayemi, I don't know if uh, you'd like to add anything else about um, this, this process of the DOI registration from the institutional perspective. Uh, yes, what DOI is an auto-generated, once you subscribe to the data site, there are some uh, information you need to fill in about data, the metadata schema. And uh, once you fill in the information, the DOI will be auto-generated. And there are options, whether it, the, whatever you are generating the DOI for is a text or a data or set or a publication. You have options you can use. 
IT as an institution, we, we, we use uh, the option of pushing it, 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 it slash D at the end of the DOI to show that it's a data set or P to show that it's a publication. So we are, you are free to make that options. You are free to choose whatever way you want to do. But once you subscribe to the data site, you and you log in, you have your login details, you log in, you select whatever you want to generate your DOI for, and then just fill in the information you see on your screen. It's pretty simple and um, you can do it on your own. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Olayemi. And another question uh, about the FAIR principles that have been mentioned throughout the presentation, and if we could elaborate on how much FAIR the data are. Uh, hopefully, if you used a FAIR matrix tool, um, I'm, I'm not sure which FAIR matrix matrix tool you're referring to, um, but as um, we've mentioned throughout the presentations, um, the FAIR principles uh, for, for research data um, state uh, specifically DOIs, uh, metadata, and identifiers as a mean to achieve fairness of data. So uh, using identifiers such as uh, DOIs and uh, registering uh, complete and rich uh, metadata for uh, your research production uh, helps uh, make your research more findable and accessible and, of course, um, more uh, reusable and interoperable too. And um, there's another question. Um, it's nice to get connected um, and attend this event. I am a member of BODAN, the virus outbreak data network in Africa, and um, we implement the FAIR data principles in the health sector in nine African countries. And it's good to know all these institutions. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for that um, comment. Um, and we'd be happy to uh, connect uh, with you and with Bowden uh, to uh, see how we can um, work uh, together uh, to uh, promote um, the research you do. And I think all the other questions uh, have been answered already. Um, if you have any other uh, questions, we still have some um, minutes left. Otherwise, uh, Paul, I don't know if you want to show the poll results. Yes, thanks, Gabi. I'm going to share the poll results uh, of the 35 people responding to the poll. Um, a little bit more than two thirds uh, responded yes to the first question. If you have an institutional repository, so the majority has one, and also the majority, uh, like the same uh, amount, like sixty nine percent, wish to uh, be uh, contacted by us and uh, after the event. So, uh, thanks a lot. Great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Paul, and um, all those who uh, completed the webinar. And um, if there's no any other um, questions, um, then um, I would like to uh, thank uh, all my uh, fellow uh, co-presenters, uh, Bosun, Harold and Olayemi for sharing uh, your perspectives and experiences uh, with data side with the community. Um, and again, we're going to be sending a feedback survey. It's just one question and it helps us uh, improve uh, the next uh, events we'll share with you. So please um, provide uh, your feedback. And also you will be receiving uh, per email the recording of these sessions and also the slides. So uh, thank you so much, everyone, and we hope to see you um, next time soon in our next events. Bye-bye.